Recording has started. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Chaim Rivas Perez, <laughs> who will introduce our uh, uh, lecturer from uh, UT Southwestern. Um, Dr. Perez uh, is uh, stepping in right now for Dr. Saad, who's away traveling and. Um, we uh, are just so proud of the pulmonary division and everything that you all have done and how much you've pushed the quality points for particularly the care for uh, ICU. Uh, so I'll let you introduce your speaker and we'll get going with our lecture today. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kruger. Um, it is a um, um, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Um, Sarah Huen. Um, she did her um, medicine at Northwestern uh, University. That was followed by um, a residency in internal medicine at University of New York. Um, she finished her training at Yale uh, University in uh, nephrology, uh, where she also um, uh, completed a PhD in investigative medicine um, as well. She also has a postdoctoral training in immunobiology. Um, she's been uh, already funded several times. She currently has uh, NIH grant funding for um, uh, research that is titled Fasting Metabolism to Improve Survival in Bacterial Sepsis. Um, currently, Dr. Huan is the Assistant Professor um, of Nephrology and Pharmacology at uh, University of Texas um, Southwestern Medical Center. Um, today, the, the lecture is titled uh, Metabolism, Nutrition, and Sepsis, a Need for Precision Medicine where she will be discussing recent clinical trials targeting nutritional support in clinical ill patients. Um, she will also describe the harms of high protein feeding in patients with sepsis and potential harms of exercise dietary carbohydrates in patients with bacterial sepsis. So um, with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Huan. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I'm delighted for the opportunity to discuss an important clinical topic of great interest to me and to share with you some of our related preclinical work. So I have no disclosures. So today I'll be talking about metabolism and nutrition in sepsis. I'll start with defining the clinical conundrum of metabolism and feeding in critical illness, and then discuss the lessons from and limitations of ICU clinical studies. I'll then discuss some preclinical approaches to understanding the roles of metabolic derangements in sepsis, in particular fasting metabolism resulting from anorexia of acute illness. And by the end of the talk, I hope that you'll appreciate that there's a critical need for precision medicine with respect to metabolism and nutrition management for septic patients. So let's define the clinical conundrum. So the most recent clinical consensus defines sepsis as life-threatening organ dysfunction owing to dysregulated host response to infection. And we all appreciate that sepsis can cause severe multi-organ dysfunction. And despite the availability of broad spectrum antibiotics and life supporting technologies such as mechanical ventilation and dialysis, even though sepsis accounts for only 10% of hospitalizations, it accounts for 50% of in-hospital mortality. And it remains the most expensive hospital diagnosis. And although there are many metabolic derangements associated with sepsis, including metabolic changes associated with poor appetite, hyperlipidemia, dysglycemia, and proteolysis, whether they are truly dysregulated and pathologic is unclear. So let's start with a case. We have a 70-year-old man who presents with hypoxic respiratory failure. He's febrile, his chest x-ray has diffuse bilateral opacities consistent with acute respiratory distress syndrome. He's hypotensive and requires pressors. He's also hyperglycemic, reflective of an insulin resistant state. He's also hypoalbuminemic, possibly reflecting a combination of malnutrition and a hypercatabolic state. So common questions remain, when and how should we feed him? And should we fix these metabolic disorders? So one clinical conundrum that has persisted for decades is what is the purpose of anorexia of acute illness? Why should anorexia accompany a catabolic response? Well, one possibility could be that it allows for the release of substrates that are specifically needed to cope with the illness 
and a decrease in the intake of substrates that are either not required or perhaps interfere with defense mechanisms. So let's consider some sepsis-associated metabolic changes. So while lipolysis and the resulting hyperlipidemia could be considered maladaptive, there is evidence that lipoproteins are capable of binding and neutralizing endotoxin, and lipid substrates could then be fuel for organs that are dependent on fatty acid oxidation. Dysglycemia is the most commonly observed disorder, and it's possible that its purpose is to redirect glucose utilization and perhaps fuel the immune system for the initial antimicrobial response. Proteolysis is so often feared because it results in muscle atrophy, but much of its purpose could be used to fuel the liver synthesis of acute phase proteins, many of which are important in host defense. So are there any lessons from clinical studies that can shed some light on these sepsis-associated metabolic changes? So the clinical studies I will discuss next will highlight some of the clinical questions that have been investigated. So first, calories, how much and what route? Second, protein, how do we limit negative protein balance? And finally, glucose, should we or should we not correct hyperglycemia? So let's begin with calories. One of the first studies to address this question of how much to feed as a randomized controlled trial was the eden Ardsnet trial. Mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS, 40% of whom were on vasopressors, were enrolled within 48 hours of acute lung injury. They tested the hypothesis of giving trophic feeds at about 25% of estimated caloric needs, enough to maintain gut integrity versus full feeding at 100% of caloric needs. So there are no differences in ventilator-free days. That was their primary endpoint. However, the full feeding group had more GI issues related to vomiting and high residuals, and they also required more insulin. So one can conclude that trophic feeds to maintain gut integrity is safe in mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS for up to five days. The route of feeding in critically ill patients was investigated in the Calories and the Nutria 2 trials. They compared early full enteral versus parenteral feeding. Both studies had mostly mechanically ventilated patients requiring pressors. In both trials, there are no differences in mortality. The enterally fed patients had more GI issues, and most concerning observation in the Nutria 2 study was more bowel ischemia and colonic obstruction. So this led to concerns about full enteral feeding in mechanically ventilated patients on high doses of vasopressors. Then the EPANIC trial tested whether in critically ill patients who are not meeting caloric goals with enteral feeds should either get early or delayed parenteral supplemental feeds. And the groups are volume matched, and they also had a similar study in children. In both the adult and pediatric trials, the early group had longer ICU and hospital stays, as well as, as well as more new infections, longer duration of mechanical ventilation, and renal replacement therapy. So this trial suggests that supplementing insufficient enteral feeds with parenteral feeds for full caloric goals may be harmful. Two recent studies tested again the question of how much calories of enteral feeds to give critically ill patients both initiated within 24 hours of ICU admission. The PERMIT, or Permissive Underfeeding Trial, similar to the EDEN trial, studied a low-calorie target compared to standard, while the TARGET trial studied a high-calorie feed compared to standard, and both were protein and volume controlled. In the PERMIT trial, there was no difference in mortality. But in the low-calorie group, there was fewer incident renal replacement therapy, lower blood glucose, and lower insulin use. There was also no difference in mortality in the target study. And in the high-calorie group, they had more GI issues and higher insulin use. So one can conclude that permissive underfeeding at 50% of caloric goals for up to two weeks is safe, and that giving more does not necessarily improve outcomes. So what are some lessons from these target, the trials targeting caloric goals when feeding ICU patients? 
Well, there is no mortality differences, the hardest and most relevant outcome. So you could be nihilistic and say, well, it doesn't matter what or how we feed ICU patients. Most of us would probably take the middle ground and conclude it's probably a good idea to avoid excessive enteral feeds in mechanically ventilated patients on pressors. And if patients can't tolerate enteral feeds, parental feeds could cause harm if given early and aggressively. But are there other possibilities? Are there other unanswered questions? So let's discuss some limitations of these trials and ask some unanswered questions. So the first limitation is that energy requirements were estimated, not measured. So how do we calculate energy requirements? Well, the guidelines say that we should use indirect calorimetry to measure energy expenditure here depicted in mechanically ventilated patients connected to the ventilator and for spontaneously breathing patients using a canopy. Indirect calorimetry, although it's the gold standard, is not perfect. There are possible leaks, instruments can be inaccurate, extracorporeal treatments such as dialysis and ECMO, high PEEP in FiO2 in vented patients and supplemental oxygen in spontaneously breathing patients can affect measurements. And the lack of availability due to cost is often cited as the main limiting factor. So as a result, the general practice and in most clinical trials, predictive equations are used to estimate energy expenditure. And these are calculated using static anthropometric measurements like height and weight. And as a result, they are inaccurate. And unfortunately, as the guidelines say, no single equation emerges as being more accurate. So the equations that are used widely vary. So one can say that we might not be able to accurately calculate caloric needs. Well, what about individual variability? Do we make a calculation and then set it and forget it? So back in 1942, Kuthberson hypothesized the metabolic ebb and flow responses to hemorrhagic shock and traumatic injury. And this highlights that energy expenditure is likely dynamic and changes during the course of critical illness. So the ebb phase is the initial hemorrhagic shock phase when energy expenditure decreases. Then during the flow phase, energy expenditure increases above baseline in order to initiate the repair phase. In septic patients, one study used sequential measurements of metabolic rate and it suggested that energy expenditure could vary both during the time course of disease and by the severity of the illness. So the more severe the sepsis, the lower the resting metabolic rate. And the increase of energy expenditure does not occur until the recovery phase. So what do we know about the dynamics of energy expenditure in sepsis? Well, the dynamic nature of inflammation has been proposed to have an early pro-inflammatory response followed by an immunosuppressed phase. So some have postulated that the metabolism and energy expenditure may also follow a similar pattern in which there is a hypercatabolic phase during the initial pro-inflammatory response and then a hypocatabolic phase during the immunosuppressed phase. And then recovery demands higher energy expenditure. But how do we determine which phase a patient is in? How do we calculate and measure energy preference and substrate preference and utilization throughout the course of disease? So it is possible that caloric requirements differ throughout the phases of sepsis, and we don't have a good way of measuring this. Another limitation of these studies is that feeds were mostly not standardized and the main targets were calories. So is it possible that the type of calorie matters? And finally, these studies had significant cohort heterogeneity. Among the studies discussed, the medical versus surgical ICU composition widely varied, and the number of septic patients also varied, and in the calories trial, sepsis was not specifically reported. So it is possible that different types of critically ill patients should be fed differently. Next, let's consider protein. We know that negative protein balance is not good, so how do we limit it? In a hypercatabolic state, there's an increase in net protein breakdown resulting in a negative nitrogen balance, 
which results in muscle atrophy and is associated with mortality. So it would be ideal if we could either use a drug or high protein feeds to minimize the negative nitrogen balance, and we hope that it would improve survival. So growth hormone was previously tested in critically ill patients. And while it did improve nitrogen balance, it also increased mortality. It was associated with increased insulin sepsis and also worse hyperglycemia and increased insulin use. So how about high protein feeds? Well, in observational studies, high protein intake is associated with less negative nitrogen balance, which is associated with increased survival. So high protein feeds can increase protein intake further, and the hypothesis would be that this would increase survival. However, randomized controlled trials investigating high protein feeds have not yet shown any benefit. So what could be some explanations to these findings? Well, protein intake associations with outcomes are confounded by immortal time bias in patients who survive long enough to achieve nutritional targets and also by indication bias, where patients with a good prognosis not only are likely to have better GI function, but also are more likely to receive more attention to optimize their nutritional support. But alternatively, could there be harm in excess dietary protein? So one potential harm that's actually quite common is urea osmotic diuresis, which occurs in the context of high blood urea nitrogen and high urinary output driven by urea. It accounts for approximately 10% of hypernatremia cases in the ICU. And why is this relevant? Well, hypernatremia is associated with increased mortality in ICU patients, and it's difficult to treat without over or under correcting similar to hyponatremia. And main causes are high protein feeds and high catabolism. And the associated hypernatremia is often exacerbated by loop diuretics and other causes for an osmotic diuresis, such as poorly controlled hyperglycemia. So is it possible that nitrogen balance then is the wrong target? So let's consider patients with acute kidney injury requiring continuous renal replacement therapy. So it's known that CRRT will increase loss of protein and possibly even increase catabolism. So it's intuitive that we should replace protein loss during dialysis. So one randomized controlled trial tested this using indirect calorimetry to guide nutritional therapy and escalated dietary protein in patients on CRRT. And they did observe that patients with increased nitrogen balance had a better survival and higher protein intake was also associated with an increased nitrogen balance. However, higher protein intake did not associate with improved survival. So perhaps the true relationship is an unknown factor that minimizes negative nitrogen balance resulting in improved survival. So then is it possible that we should be focusing on stopping the inflammatory process that's driving the protein breakdown? So returning to the AKI patients on CRRT, there was a post hoc analysis of the renal study, which was a CRRT dose intensity randomized control trial. Well, this revealed that patients with higher dietary protein had increased mortality. If we looked at the overall cohort, 50% had sepsis, but there were significantly more septic patients in the high protein group than the low. And is the presence of sepsis then relevant? Well, then it's of interest that when one of the observational cohort studies that concluded that high dietary protein intake was associated with better outcomes, it showed that in subgroup analysis that the improved survival was only observed in patients without sepsis, while those with sepsis, there was a trend towards higher mortality. And it is unfortunate that this relationship was not published in the original study but it's buried in a subsequent review article. And moreover, one study that measured leg amino acid output in septic patients with net amino acid uptake estimating increased muscle protein synthesis and decreased protein catabolism 
while net amino acid release reflects more catabolism than protein synthesis. And what they found was that non-survivors and patients with prolonged sepsis, shown in black and red, had persistently net amino acid release despite high protein TPN. And only patients who recovered from sepsis, shown in blue, were able to attain positive muscle protein synthesis. So perhaps the unknown factor then is the resolution of sepsis that reflects the true relationship of positive nitrogen balance and improved survival. Last, let's consider glucose. Should we correct hyperglycemia? So prior to the NICE sugar trial, the observational data was clear that hyperglycemia associated with increased mortality. So it was intuitive to hypothesize that using insulin to mitigate hyperglycemia would improve survival. But then after the NICE sugar trial, we saw that intensive glycemic control using insulin in critically ill patients increased mortality, likely due to increased hypoglycemic events. But patients were also exposed to both significantly more of both insulin and glucose. So while hypoglycemic events are detrimental and likely contributing to increased mortality, could the exposure of excess insulin and glucose be harmful? So our current approach is modest correction of hyperglycemia to avoid hypoglycemia, but could we limit obligate insulin requirements in our feeding regimens? So returning to our patient, he's mechanically ventilated, his kidney function is now worsening, and cultures are still pending. We're still left with many questions about his metabolic state and whether we should feed him. And if so, what should we feed him? What are his energy needs? Will he be able to utilize dietary protein? And could there be harm in what and how we feed him? So let's pause for a moment and revisit the clinical conundrum of anorexia in acute illness and what is his purpose. And perhaps we should consider the concept of teleology to explain phenomenon in terms of the purpose they serve rather than the cause by which they arise. So in other words, there's still much to understand about the phenomenon before we attempt to fix abnormal values by any means possible. So next I'll discuss some preclinical work from my laboratory that seeks to understand the role of metabolic derangements in sepsis, in particular fasting metabolism that results from anorexia of acute illness. So anorexia is a component of sickness behavior that's highly evolutionarily conserved. So then what's the purpose of this conserved response? Well, it remains a question of whether it's an adaptive and protective response in conserving and reorganizing energy expenditure, or it's maladaptive in the face of a presumed hypercatabolic state. So as a postdoc in Ruslan Metzitov's lab at Yale, we use common laboratory mouse models of infection, listeria for a bacterial infection, and influenza for a viral infection and then we measure their food intake. So both infections will suppress food intake, uh, with the listeria-infected mice having a much more dramatic decrease in their food intake compared with flu-infected mice. Next, we asked, how does feeding the mice during this anorectic period affect outcomes? So we fed mice a common ICU tube feed, Abrapromote, which had similar macronutrient composition compared to standard rodent chow. So in listeria-infected mi uh, mice, feeding them 20% of their daily caloric intake dramatically increased mortality. However, we were surprised to see the opposite effect in influenza infection as hypocaloric feeding improves survival. So which food component was responsible for this effect? Well, we found that glucose, but not protein or fat, increased mortality in listeria-infected mice while glucose had a partial effect in rescuing influenza mortality. Inhibition of glucose utilization with 2-deoxyglucose, which is a glucose analog that cannot be metabolized, rescued listeria-infected mice, but uniformly killed flu-infected mice. And this metabolis glucose metabolism effect was independent of pathogen load. It was also independent of classic inflammatory markers. 
And in order to avoid host pathogen effects, we also tested the effect of glucose metabolism on sterile inflammation models using lipopolysaccharide or LPS, a gram negative cell wall component to model bacterial inflammation and poly IC, which is a synthetic analog of double-stranded RNA to induce viral inflammation. So in these models, there is no live pathogen. And the glucose effect on survival was the same as within the live infection models. So what are the implications of these metabolic adaptation pathways in the context of managing patients with sepsis? Well, first we need to acknowledge that the purpose and the regulation of these metabolic changes during sepsis is not completely understood. Next, changes in metabolism may in fact be part of immune defense. And this suggests that host defense against infection consists of not only resistance, which is focused on pathogen clearance, but also of tolerance in which physiologic responses are activated to limit tissue damage caused by the infection and inflammation. So many of the physiologic and metabolic changes that occur in response to an infection may in fact be beneficial and part of tissue tolerance defense pathways. So then we must also consider the possibility that how we feed and medicate patients, septic patients, in order to normalize some of these presumed maladaptive metabolic changes could in fact be detrimental. And finally, the optimal nutritional management may differ depending on the type of infection, and it's likely to become more complex even within classes of pathogens. So if we go back and look at the feeding trials in the critical uh, uh, illness, we find that there's a huge mixture of patients that comprise these clinical trials, including burn, sepsis, trauma, traumatic brain injury, and patients across different ICU settings. And among the septic patients, there's certainly no differentiation of the type of infection, and we know that 30% of presumed sepsis cases are culture negative. And there's a common critique that mouse studies of sepsis are not translatable to humans, reflecting on so many negative studies that appear to work in preclinical studies but show no benefit in patients. So if we look back at our mouse data, feeding increased mortality in listeria infection while it decreased mortality in flu infection. If you mix the two cohorts together, there's no difference in mortality outcome. And this is quite similar to what we see in clinical trials. So let's return to our patient now who is more hyperglycemic on stress dose steroids and the lab just called with gram negative rods growing in the blood cultures. So could glucose be harmful and if so, how? So my laboratory has been interested in understanding the mechanism of glucose-mediated death and bacterial inflammation. And to explore this, we looked to metabolic programs that are activated in fasting. And these include fibroblast growth factor 21, or FGF21, liver ketogenesis, a global switch to fatty acid oxidation, and autophagy. Our current work is focused on FGF21 and ketogenesis. So normal fasting metabolism consists of increased circulation of free fatty acids from adipose lipolysis. These free fatty acids through PPAR alpha activation will induce the liver to produce ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate being the main ketone body. Ketones are then used as alternate fuel in extrahepatic tissues, especially glucose dependent tissues such as the brain. And ketones are also thought to have other functions, such as chromatin remodeling and antioxidant effects. Also through PPAR alpha, FGF21 is induced during fasting and known to regulate adaptive metabolic responses during starvation. Most of the described effects of FGF21 act on the brain in the hypothalamus. And it's unclear if there's direct effects on other organs, such as the heart and the kidney. So in endotoxemia, Glucose supplementation causes a suppression of these components of fasting metabolism, including circulating free fatty acids, uh, the induction of FGF21, as well as uh, uh, ketone production. And all of these are associated with increased mortality. So ongoing projects in the lab are tackling the questions of how does FGF21 promote survival in sepsis 
and whether ketogenesis per se is required for survival or merely a byproduct of fasting metabolism. So next I'll briefly discuss our work on FGF21 in sepsis. So FGF21 knockout mice don't make FGF21 and are more susceptible to death in LPS sepsis. In order to determine what FGF21 does during sepsis, we looked at various biomarkers of organ injury. But surprisingly, we didn't find any differences in overt organ damage in the FGF21 knockout mice compared to the wild type mice. As measured by ALT, troponin, and creatinine levels, there was also no differences in blood gases and blood uh, lactate levels. But what we did find was that the knockout mice were more hypothermic and bradycardic. So to summarize a very large body of work, we found that similar to fasting, circulating FGF21 is also derived from the liver during sepsis. While we've not found any evidence that FGF21 acts directly on the heart or adipose tissue to regulate heart rate and body temperature, our current working model is that FGF21 might in fact be acting on the hindbrain, which participates in autonomic control, including cardiovascular function and thermoregulation. So you might be asking, well, is FGF21 translatable to humans then? Well, in patient studies, high FGF21 levels associate with mortality. However, is this cause or consequence? And in fact, high levels of circulating FGF21 in septic patients associates with severity of disease and could reflect the body trying to activate protective responses. But it's also associated with septic patients with baseline heart failure and chronic kidney disease. So in our model of endotoxemia, FGF21 induction is acute. And this is in contrast to chronically elevated FGF21 levels, which is seen in several disease states, including obesity, diabetes, heart failure, and CKD. And in fact, in a mouse model that chronically overexpresses FGF21, they are not protected from bacterial sepsis, but instead trend towards more mortality. And there's emerging data to suggest the possibility of an FGF21 resistant disease state. And so there's a lot more complexities that we need to consider before we can translate FGF21 into the ICU. Ketogenesis is another major component of fasting metabolic adaptation. We are currently actively working to understand whether there is a causative role for the observed association of glucose-induced suppression of ketogenesis with mortality. So how are ketones made? Well, ketogenesis results from two acetyl-CoA's derived from fatty acid beta-oxidation, and the rate-limiting enzyme is HMG-CoA synthase 2, or HMGCS2. And the resulting ketone bodies are acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And ketogenesis is thought to mainly occur in the liver, and HMGCS2 is induced in fasting, while LPS will suppress it. So we've been really surprised to see that HMGCS2 is also induced in the kidney, both during fasting and after LPS challenge. So our working hypothesis is that circulating ketones produced during bacterial inflammation are in fact derived from the liver and that kidney HMGCS2 could be functioning to promote ketone production locally. And we're trying to understand the function of both the circulating ketones as well as the local ketones produced in the kidney. So what about ketogenesis in patients? Well, because ketogenic enzymes are down-regulated in the liver during sepsis, it was previously thought that ketogenesis is impaired in septic patients. And in the 1980s, there were many metabolism studies undertaken in critically ill post-surgical patients, many of which included septic patients from mostly bacterial infections, such as abdominal perforations, post-surgical pneumonias, and urinary tract infections. And this one looked at ketone body flux in septic patients. And what they found was that ketogenesis was in fact preserved, if not induced, in septic patients after 12 hours of saline infusion. In contrast, in septic patients who were on a continuous hypocaloric glucose and amino acid infusion, circulating ketone levels were suppressed, 
And not surprisingly, these glucose infusions also resulted in higher blood insulin and glucose levels. And hormonally, this is consistent with seminal work on ketogenesis by McGarry and Foster, in which high insulin and low glucagon levels are strong suppressors of ketogenesis. So another metabolic change during fasting is a switch from glucose oxidation to fatty acid oxidation. So one way of estimating relative fatty acid oxidation over carbohydrate oxidation is to measure respiratory quotient, or RQ, which is the ratio of CO2 eliminated and O2 consumed. And carbohydrate oxidation results in a higher RQ at 1, while lipid oxidation has a lower RQ at 0.7. So after LPS challenge in mice, there's a dramatic and rapid decrease in RQ compared to food removal, suggesting that there's a rapid global shift from carbohydrate metabolism to lipid metabolism. And this relationship was also observed in patients, where septic patients had lower RQ compared to non-septic trauma patients, suggesting that in sepsis, there is a switch from carbohydrate metabolism to fatty acid oxidation. And in another study, septic patients compared with healthy controls showed that at baseline, after an overnight fast, septic patients had higher fat oxidation and lower glucose oxidation. In this same study, during a hyperglycemic glucose clamp, where blood glucose was clamped at 12 millimoles, or 216 milligrams per deciliter, glucose oxidation could not be induced in the septic patients. And instead, fat oxidation and ketogenesis were suppressed by the glucose clamp. And this is consistent with what's known biochemically and hormonally as regulated by insulin that the provision of glucose will lead to suppression of fatty acid oxidation and promotion of lipogenesis. So there are two major regulators of fatty acid oxidation, including PGC1-alpha, which regulates mitochondrial biogenesis and coordinates lipid metabolism, and PPAR-alpha, a master regulator of fatty acid oxidation. And in preclinical models of bacterial sepsis, if you inhibit either of these regulators, it results in worse septic organ injury, while augmenting their activity limits septic organ damage. And this suggests that fatty acid oxidation pathways appear to be protective in sepsis. Finally, autophagy is a major pathway that is activated by fasting. Autophagy is a regulated cellular me mechanism that removes unfolded or misfolded proteins as well as damaged organelles, and this results in recycling of nutrients and promoting cell survival. A lot of preclinical research has shown the importance of autophagy in health and disease. With respect to bacterial sepsis, many preclinical models have shown that inhibiting autophagy will increase septic organ damage, while augmenting autophagy will limit septic organ damage. And is there any clinical evidence of a role for autophagy in sepsis? Well, in one single center prospective randomized controlled trial investigating intensive insulin therapy in a surgical ICU, where they selected available liver biopsies from non-survivors matched for baseline characteristics. And what they found was fewer autophagic vacuoles in the intensive insulin group compared to the conventionally treated group, suggesting that suppression of autophagy may be more pronounced in the intensive insulin group. And this is supported by what's known molecularly as insulin will inhibit autophagy by activating mTOR, which is a strong inhibitor of autophagy. So I've now shown you multiple lines of evidence that components of fasting metabolism are protective in bacterial sepsis and that glucose and insulin suppress these pathways. And one can consider that the insulin resistance we see in sepsis is meant to promote these fasting metabolic pathways. And if these components of fasting metabolism are protective in bacterial sepsis, are there alternative approaches we could consider in our current management of metabolism and nutrition? So one example to consider is our current paradigm in managing hyperglycemia in critical illness. Because of the NICE sugar trial, we take a conservative insulin approach and avoid hypoglycemia. But 
What are the potential risks of feeding excess carbohydrates? Well, this will lead to an increase in obligate insulin requirements, which not only risk hypoglycemia, but also the insulin exposure will inhibit fatty acid oxidation and autophagy. But could we alternatively limit the glycemic load, thereby decreasing the insulin requirements, and could this lead to better outcomes? But is this specific to bacterial sepsis? So we are collaborating with Javier Naira at the University of Kentucky to address these questions. So using the ICU cohort Javier generated at UT Southwestern and then at U University of Kentucky to investigate AKI in the ICU, we're interested in looking at just the ICU patients with sepsis while excluding patients with type 1 diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes and those with primary ICU admissions for DKA or hyperosmolar hyperglycemia and those with ESRD. And we're interested in whether insulin exposure and blood glucose levels and carbohydrate and glucose exposure associate with poor outcomes, including mortality and major kidney events such as death dialysis and EGFR decline. And importantly, we plan to do a subgroup analysis of bacterial, viral, and fungal sepsis to see if the relationship of insulin and glucose exposure is specific to the class of pathogen. So I hope I've convinced you that we need precision medicine in our management of metabolism and nutrition in sepsis. Areas where we need precision include knowing the type and phase of critical illness and type of infection if septic. We need a better understanding of metabolic pathways, how to measure them, and understanding what biomarkers mean. There's a need to develop ways of measuring substrate preference and the capacity for utilization. And while many of these are still areas of research, one practical thing we could do is to know what you are feeding your patients and to consider potential harm. So our case patient is hyperglycemic on steroids and blood cultures are growing gram-negative rods, and perhaps giving excess carbohydrates might be harmful. But do you even know what the carbohydrate contents are in the tube feeds you prescribe? Well, since our patient now has AKI, we will give Novasource Renal or Nepro, which are both similar in contents. There's 44 grams of carbohydrates per 237 milliliters. So at 50 milliliters per hour, that's 220 grams of carbohydrates a day, which is equivalent to 55 teaspoons of sugar or five and a half cans of soda. And a careful look at the ingredients list, in addition to added sugar, corn syrup is the second ingredient after water. And this, in fact, is the main ingredient to pecan pie, since the protein source is caseinate from milk. In essence, we're feeding pecan pie a la mode to our patients, sans the pecans. So you have to wonder, is this optimal? So let's consider another common scenario. The patient is elderly and frail, and sarcopenic on presentation. So he's placed on high protein feeds to minimize further muscle loss. A week into the ICU stay, the patient becomes polyuric, creatinine is stable, but BUN levels are continuously rising and now well above 100. We're often asked to consider dialysis for uremia as typically patients are also altered, though there are usually many reasons for altered mental status. But at what point is too much protein causing harm? And also in this case, do you even know how much protein the patient is receiving? So if we take a common high protein tube feed such as Replete, there is 16 grams of protein per 250 milliliters. So at 75 milliliters per hour, that's 115 grams of protein a day. Often added to the tube feeds is beneprotein, which is a protein powder made up of whey protein isolate from milk. Two packets TID will add an additional 36 grams of protein a day. So in total, this is approximately 150 grams of protein a day. And if he's tolerating the feeds with no disruptions, this is within the guidelines of two grams per kilo for an average 70 kilogram critically ill patient. But important caveats to that are important to consider. Do you know what the true dry weight of the patient is? Is the current body weight reflective of edema? 
septic patients are often 10 liters fluid positive within the first few days of ICU admission. And also, how much of the protein is the patient capable of utilizing? And is the protein mostly just being excreted as urea and perhaps causing a urea diuresis? So returning to the issue of urea-induced diuresis, how does one diagnose this condition? Well, urine osmolality will be in excess of 300, and the component of the urine osms that are made up of electrolytes, such as sodium and potassium, is less than 600 over a 24-hour period. There's no glucosuria, and the urine urea nitrogen is greater than 700 milligrams per deciliter. So once the diagnosis of urea diuresis is established, then one must consider and determine the cause of the increased urea generation. Oftentimes it's high protein diets, hypercatabolism, corticosterone use, and GI bleeding, and then correct for the factors responsible. And additionally, one must increase free water to avoid or treat established hypernatremia, avoid loop diuretics, and dialysis without other indications is really only used in refractory cases. So let's focus a moment on hypercatabolism and high protein diet. So it's critically important to assess the level of inflammation as this will reflect the patient's ability to utilize dietary protein. And then consider whether the patient is getting too much protein, more than they're able to appropriately utilize, and then weigh the overall risk and benefit of continuing high protein feeds. And remember, hypernatremia caused by urea diuresis is not a benign complication. But ultimately, a preventive approach is critical, as optimizing protein intake to limit sarcopenia and frailty is much more effective when patients are not acutely ill and hypercatabolic. One last timely scenario, our COVID patient, who is obese, diabetic, and hyperglycemic. So could the diet composition affect outcomes? But you might be asking yourselves, well, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus, and based on the preclinical data I just presented with influenza, would provision of glucose be protective? Well, the answer is not that clear. So COVID-19 has proven to be vastly different from typical flu presentation, and the morbidity and mortality appear to be driven more by the immune response than the actual viral infection. And there have been a couple of small studies showing that increased circulating bacterial endotoxin levels associate with worse COVID outcomes. So how, so what could be causing the increase in circulating bacterial endotoxin in COVID-19? Well, there are some postulates that the late sequelae of COVID-19 due to secondary bacterial infection in the lungs could release endotoxin into the bloodstream. Alteration of the gut microbiota or the intestinal lining could also cause gut translocation of bacteria or bacterial components such as endotoxin, leading to sepsis and cytokine storm. And it's also well established that obesity is a major risk factor for severe COVID-19, and obesity is known to be associated with increased circulating endotoxin. And finally, obesity is a hyperinsulinemic state. So in fact, the relationship of insulin treatment in type 2 diabetics with confirmed COVID-19 was associated with increased mortality, AKI, and need for mechanical ventilation. Although this was a retrospective cohort analysis, this relationship remained significant with propensity score matching to control for baseline comorbidities and severity of disease, as well as stratification based on glucose control um, at admission. And finally, they also did an analysis of patients without hypoglycemic events, and the mortality effect still remained. Um, so if excess insulin is detrimental to COVID, is there an alternative uh, to glycemic control? So one small retrospective study in Italy investigated outcomes from a eucaloric ketogenic diet with low carbohydrates and controlled for protein compared and total protein and total energy compared to a standard diet in non-critically ill COVID patients. They did find a trend towards decreased death, ICU admission, and IL-6 levels. 
And the group has subsequently started enrolling a randomized controlled trial to more formally study this low carbohydrate diet. There's really only one other pilot study actively recruiting to test this low carbohydrate diet in COVID in Italy. And unfortunately, another study was planned at Johns Hopkins, but this with, was withdrawn due to multiple concurrent competing trials. So I'll end with a reminder that while there's still a lot to be understood about the intersection between metabolism, nutrition, and critical illness, both at the preclinical and clinical levels, there's still much we can do at the bedside to consider how we are feeding our patients and to reevaluate the risks and benefits of our current approaches. And with that, I'd like to thank my lab members who have been doing all the work despite COVID and all the other disruptions, um, my collaborators um, who have been really um, uh, necessary for our FGF21 project, as well as um, uh, Javier Naira, who's helping me with the uh, clinical studies. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Kewen, for out, an outstanding, outstanding talk. And uh, Dr. Kruger, would you, do you have anything you'd like to ask? Well, um, uh, Sarah, that was that was mind-boggling. You went through a, a lot, and um, it was uh, it was very interesting. Um, I, I think now nephrologists and nutritionists are the smartest people in the world. Um, I had one question. I know Steve McClay has some questions. You alluded with your three cases that patients are also different. So besides um, your final slide, um, I've always wondered, well, if you have a sarcopenic patient to begin with that has a body composition where they have no, no fat, then they're not going to be able to, to do much with ketosis and, and they may need more protein. And, and likewise, someone that has a lot of uh, adiposity they may they may be able to mobilize their 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 body adiposity versus making their gut work extra hard to try to digest protein because that requires energy. So in the formula, I think we need to always think about the patient type, and I, I don't think we do that very often. We don't get glucose tolerance testing. We don't do the body composition to to add into ideal body weight. I think you did allude to that. So that's that's my question: how the patient type also affects what you give them. No, absolutely. I think that that's, um, I think that's a really big area that needs more attention and research. And I think that's a critical question. How does an individual patient, how are they able to utilize either dietary substrates or either their endogenous substrates, right? And I would even say with, for example, patients who are obese, although they may have a lot of um, uh, fat and adiposity that they're able to, um, uh, that could be available to them, if they're in a metabolic state where um, they're not insulin sensitive, right, um, or there's too much insulin around, they may not be capable, they may not be able to um, access um, those lipid storage. Um, and that's partly why giving even more insulin becomes a problem in these patients because that suppresses their ability to um, um, induce lipolysis and thereby um, release some of those fat stores. Um, with regard to the sarcopenic patient, I agreed that, that that's definitely an issue. I'm not saying that we should limit um, uh, their dietary protein and 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 uh, necessarily. I, my my concerns often are is that we often try to exceed. I think the patient's capacity of utilization, um, and and it often is you know driven by kind of their over overall presentation state and their sarcopenia and wanting to try to augment their uh, protein. Uh, synthesis uh, capacity, um, but oftentimes the limiting factor is not so much the dietary protein intake, but often their ability to utilize a protein, which is yet another area that we don't have any good information as, as far as trying to promote uh, protein synthesis in those cases. Yeah, Chris? Chris, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah. Um, Sarah, this is Steve McClave. Um, uh, I've been interested in critical care nutrition for 20 years. Uh, I, uh, we had one nephrologist that I was aware of through this time, and he wasn't particularly good. Okay. Listening to your talk today, I'm super excited uh, to have okay. a new nephrologist readdressing all these issues and taking a fresh look at it. I feel like I've gotten an early Christmas present. Uh, listening oh, to that's people. excellent. Um, so I'm very excited, and I want to be actually get some contact information from you. I've got a couple different comments and just to, to, to sure. react to what you said. Um, you made a great argument for the teleologic argument that about the value of fasting and ketogenesis. And, right. and we've all had the feeling that with our early feeding, we're disrupting a, 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 a teleologic design of humans, and that may be a bad thing. The other side of that argument is that those teleologic mechanisms were designed for the caveman who gets bit by a saber-toothed tiger, and he's either going to survive or not survive over 12 to 24 hours. And with sure. our modern ICUs, we have extended into a super physiologic thing that our bodies weren't designed for. Sure. So you've made a really good case for fasting metabolism and preserving that, but at how long do we preserve that? Because the message I'm getting is don't feed our patients. Right. I think that that's um, a fair comment. And I would say that um, there are, you know, from my preclinical work, um, I would say that the there are a bit a few caveats to consider. The the animal models that we're using are are also animal models that were otherwise healthy, right? They weren't diabetic, they weren't aged um, uh, mice. We also um, were only feeding during the initial um, early period where they're anorectic. Um, so typically it was like the first few days um, um, of the infection. Patients become more complicated, right? Because most of the patients come in, they're elderly, they're, they have multiple comorbidities, et cetera. But there's also this issue of knowing where they're at in terms of the phases of sepsis. And we often have a lot of you know pa patients who have had multiple um, ICU admissions um, and multiple courses um, of infection. And so in that respect, right, like where they are in their kind of overall trajectory of their sepsis um, uh, of the different phases is also um, unclear. And so that's another major question that we don't have a, a good understanding of in terms of at what phase is a patient uh, in their sepsis um, uh, spectrum? What's in, in that particular phase, what substrate do they prefer, right? And would be most optimal um, mm -hmm. in order to deal with that phase of illness? And I think too, in terms of, you know, what is driving their, these metabolic changes um, uh, during the course of illness? Um, you know, how is that modified by the type of uh, critical illness? How is that modified by the different types of infection? And I think the other thing um, to comment upon in terms of fasting metabolism is that there are a lot of components of fasting metabolism that can be maintained on a low carbohydrate diet. Um, and in part because many of the uh, metabolic pathways that appear to have some protective effects in sepsis um, are mainly inhibited by insulin. So in, this, in the setting of just hyperinsulinemia, and then if you're giving patients a lot of carbohydrates, and a lot of our tube feeds have actually significant amount of carbohydrates with added sugar, um, we're just also then increasing their insulin requirements, thereby shutting down a lot of these metabolic pathways, um, such as fatty acid oxidation and autophagy, that um, would otherwise be still probably still active while feeding them, but just with less carbohydrates. So I think that there are approaches that doesn't necessarily require not feeding patients, but still being able to maintain 
um, or promote some of these protective metabolic pathways. The, the other reaction I had this fabulous talk was the uh, the difference between viral and bacterial infection and fuel utilization, and it it it, it, it reignited that age old argument of. Uh, uh, feed a cold, starve a fever. The cold tends to be viral, the fever tends to be bacterial. Yeah. When we were doing the guidelines, we said we know in sepsis, they don't handle any of the three macronutrients. There's antibiotic resistance, there's insulin resistance, and mitochondria are failing, so beta oxidation of fat is, is messed up. So I agree with going slowly, ramping up slowly, trying to preserve uh, autophagy. Um, the other side of the coin, and this is what I, I was missing in your thing is, we also feel we have an obligation to maintain commensal bacteria and barrier defenses, because if we don't, the gut is gonna accelerate all these processes. Um, and the other side of this argument was in COVID pandemic, it's a viral infection. This argument gave us even more impetus to aggressively feed the COVID-19 patient. But, in this argument about holding back on the sepsis bacterial patient, what is the role of barrier defenses and microbiome? And is that argument not as strong as the argument to preserve uh, fasting metabolism? Yeah, no, I, I think the gut uh, barrier is critically important as well. Um, and, you know, that's not um, an area that our my lab is currently focused on, um, but uh, certainly feeding um, dietary intake will uh, modify um, the gut microbiome tremendously. Um, I will comment though that um, in uh, recently uh, one a group this is also preclinical has shown that um, inherent within the colon is. Uh, expression of the, of the ketogenic enzyme, um, HMGCS2, and it's critically important in maintaining the intestinal stem cells. Um, and, you know, ins uh, insulin is a very strong suppressor of this enzyme, both in activity and also um, in production uh, of the enzyme. So that, I would say, in Another uh, potential hypothesis one can uh, consider is the fact that maybe not so much fasting, um, pro uh, you can't do prolonged fasting, but another uh, approach, again, to maintaining gut integrity is to enhance the ketogenic pathways. Again, that would also require um, a, a low carbohydrate approach um, to you know, limit the insulin um, requirements in the endogenous insulin production in order to um, avoid preventing some of these pathways um, and maintaining gut um, the, uh, the gut integrity. Um, I think that that's a really great question. And, I, and again, the COVID is, uh, is really shown to be very different. Um, and I think that, like I had mentioned earlier, is, is that the bacterial versus viral uh, difference is very simplistic. I think that it's gonna be much more complex even within classes of pathogens, um, depending on virulence factors, et cetera. Um, and I think that um, the other thing about COVID is, is that uh, the vast majority of patients who are suffering from um, pretty poor outcomes are during the late phases um, and not necessarily during uh, the, the period of uh, viral um, replication, and many of whom are um, behaving more like bacterial sepsis, some of whom actually do have bacterial um, secondary infections. Um, and if they do develop you know, um, uh, intestinal permeability and gut translocation, then they start behaving like bacterial inflammation because uh, they're releasing either actual bacteria or bacterial components um, into the bloodstream. So One I think, again, too. this is where the phases of illness becomes, um, you know, critical. critical and complex. And I, I think that sepsis um, is a very complex condition um, and, and trying to dissect through the details. And I think that's where a lot of the, um, you know, important hopefully advances will come in trying to understand um, all these different moving parts. 
one last question and I'll shut, I promise I'll shut up. Um, in North America, we pushed the protein dose because of the concept of anabolic resistance. In Europe, they backed off because of uh, uh, when the urea creatinine ratio goes up, they felt that was toxic to muscle, caused muscle dysfunction and delayed recovery after the ICU. Now you've added a, another toxic toxicity of protein, that urea osmotic diuresis. So, so what do we do? Do we do we not worry about is anabolic resistance uh, a non-issue because uh, they're having trouble utilizing protein versus the toxicity? Uh, where do we go? We push the yeah, tip around. I, you know, I'd love to kind of brainstorm about that. I, I This is one of my biggest pet peeves because we get consulted a lot about this um, with elevated your um, BUNs and, you know, what to, what to do with it. They, they're altered. They may need dialysis. Um, and then they're also developing this terrible hypernatremia. I mean, I've seen cases with uh, that it's gone up as high as 160s. Um, there's serum sodiums. I, I think the critical knowledge gap that we have is an understanding of, one, how, how to measure whether or not a patient is actually able to utilize protein. And obviously underlying that is, you know, what are the major um, inhibitors of the ability of muscle um, protein synthesis? I think a lot of it is going to be the general term of there's still the ongoing inflammatory process is preventing um, appropriate protein synthesis and it's going to promote c continued catabolism as long as the inflammation is present. And so, yeah, it's a ge very general and hand wavy re response that we need to deal with the underlying process. Um, but is there a way of promoting protein synthesis while the inflammation is still ongoing, that I think is 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 unclear. Thank you. I got to get you into the nutrition community. I got to get you into Aspen, and it's a joy hearing you talk today. What a talk. Thank you Okay, very much. thank you. Yeah, I'd love to um, uh, touch base again. Um, I don't know how to get you my contact information, but I'll, we'll I'll find you. We, we'll, yeah. we'll get it through Eleanor. I, I, <laughs> okay. I have it. Well, Jason I can, I can, has my, my email. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so, Sarah, we'd like to talk long, but everybody um, actually yeah. is starting to go to clinic yeah. and stuff. So, uh, Got it. Jason wants to show you something. Yeah, oh, okay. So uh, real quick, and I see Dr. Letter, she knows what's coming. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we have a tradition here at U of L, and we've continued it through our virtual grand rounds that a guest speaker, we give them a gift that's something that is very identifiable with Louisville. So you will be receiving your very own Louisville Slugger bat. <laughs> oh, wow, cool. <laughs> so and it will have it personalized with uh, your name and the date and everything. And, uh, oh, so it's that's become awesome. Even, yeah, so... Uh, Dr. Letter, as I can see here, she passed out a few of these in her time here, and uh, Dr. Kruger has too. And um, we we thank you so much. This has been out, absolutely outstanding. And uh, I know there's a couple of people that had some questions in the chat. What I'll do, I I will get you guys Dr. Hewen's email, and uh, you can email her. I just know the time's kind of getting uh, getting getting tight here for everybody. So yeah, but thank okay. you, Dr. Hewen. Dr. Kruger, if you have any last words or oh, I wanted to hear if Eleanor had uh, anything she wanted to say. Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have to have you back. Uh, like, like, like Steve said, this was fantastic. We really okay. enjoyed this. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hugh. Okay. And, and uh, just everybody, again, we'll be, we will be back next week um, for our, um, no, our October 28th, and it will be the, the Pedago lecture. And um, it'll be a little different. Uh, we're, uh, uh, going to be welcoming John and Liza Marshall from Georgetown University, and uh, and uh, Dr. Cl actually Dr. John Klein kind of facilitated this, and we'll kind of have a bit different setup, more kind of more of a Q and A pre uh, pre uh, preview uh, type of presentation. But uh, we're really looking forward to it, and I hope everybody can join us again next week. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Hume, and thank you, Dr. Uh, and the, uh, if he was here, I'd say thank you, Dr. Saad, for facilitating. And uh, everybody, Dr. Letter, good to see you. Dr. Krieger, Dr. McClave, everyone. And uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.